everyone. Thank you all so much for joining us today for this town hall uh, on support for survivors of domestic violence. Before we get started, I did want to go over some logistics for this event. These have also been put in chat. This event is being recorded. Uh, we will start with some discussion questions, and after we have heard from the panelists, we will open it up for questions from the audience. You are welcome to type your questions into chat, and I will ask them. Or when you, uh, you're also welcome to raise your hand when it is time for the question and answer section, and I will call on you. When uh, you are called, you will um, be taken off mute and you'll be on video, so you can ask your question then. If you have any uh, technical issues or logistical issues, please use the chat function to resolve them. We all know that domestic violence, sexual assault, and human trafficking are not new problems. They have been going on for years. My grandmother, uh, actually years ago, used to help survivors of domestic violence, and her legacy has led me to work with survivors my whole adult life. I'm so proud to be one of the founders of API Chaya. We have a continual responsibility to help survivors reclaim their lives and move forward in a positive way. I'm looking forward to our discussion and to hearing from our three special guests, Grace Wong, Riddhi Mukhrapathe, and Sandra Shanahan. I'll introduce each of them in more detail shortly. But first, let me set the stage by giving you some background on our recent work on, uh, at the legislature on behalf of survivors. So I am just going to uh, share our screen uh, to do a quick um, presentation on what we did this last session. So this um, bill, uh, Senate bill, uh, I'm sorry, um, House Bill 1320 came about uh, due to changes that were, um, that had to be made during COVID to ensure survivors would still seek protection. We have seen domestic violence rates go up 30% all across the state during COVID. We have seen an increase in domestic violence related homicides, and that is all completely unacceptable. The goals of this legislation was really to make sure that we were minimizing complexity. As you know, we have six different existing state civil protection laws. Uh, each of these um, laws were enacted at different points in time. And so we really wanted to make sure that we were consolidating the six different statutes into a single chapter. We wanted to make sure that we were eliminating conflicts, gaps, and unnecessary differences among the existing laws. We wanted to make sure that we were being intentional where differences um, are warranted. The new bill reflects what has been learned over the years through experience, research, and training. For example, the importance of trauma-informed practices, emerging types of abuse, different family and household structures, more violence against younger survivors. The goal really was to make sure that we were streamlining and reducing the burden on petitions on petitioners. Protection orders are intended to be an accessible, uncomplicated, and quick way to obtain protection from harm without having to go through the criminal legal process. This really is a way to empower the individual to get the help they need when they need it. We wanted to make sure that we were addressing longstanding issues that were highlighted by the pandemic. The pandemic really brought to the forefront so many barriers that have existed for survivors to access the courts. Barriers like work, childcare, safety, language, trauma, along with a host of other issues. We also wanted to make sure that the process was safer, more efficient and effective. So ensuring that we have new ways of serving orders, filing petition, conducting hearings with statewide best practices for protection order proceedings, which as we, so many of us know are civil and so different from other court proceedings. The intent really was to make sure that we are centering the victim, providing safety for the survivor uh, without the need for the survivor to rely on or engage in the criminal uh, process to obtain a protection. Ensuring that the process of surrounding firearms is effective and efficient, because we do know when a firearm is involved in a domestic violence situation, the lethality goes up tremendously. 
again, a huge goal and intent was to make sure that we're clarifying and simplifying the statutes so that it is more accessible to all those who need them. Making sure we're incorporating technology. Uh, our criminal justice system hasn't done a very good job of making sure that that is a part of how we proceed. And this is one of the benefits that we saw during the pandemic is the more use of technology in our um, courts. And again, really making sure that we're consolidating all the laws to uh, make them more effective, accessible, and simplify the understanding of the law. So that was um, a little bit of the background on the bill that was passed this last session, which really makes Washington once again at the uh, uh, forefront nationally on how we help survivors in our state. So at this time, I would like to welcome our guests again and introduce them in more detail. First is Vidhi Mukhropadhe. She is on the shared leadership team for Legal Voice and is the director of the Sexual Violence Law Center, which provides holistic legal assistance and representation to sexual assault survivors. Riddhi is a former sexual assault and domestic violence advocate and started her legal career at the Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, followed by working as a public defender. Currently, Riddhi serves on the board of the Judicial Institute, as well as on Washington State's Gender and Justice Commission. She's a recent recipient of Senator Patty Murray's Golden Tennis Shoe Award for her work with survivors. Thank you so much, Riddhi, for taking the time to be with us today. Grace Wong is the policy director at the Asian Pacific Institute on Gender-Based Violence, a national organization providing technical assistance, training, research, and policy advocacy on issues facing victims of gender-based violence in Asian and Pacific Islander communities. Prior to her position at APIGBB, she led the public policy program at the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Grace served as the editor of the 2016 Washington State Domestic Violence Manual for Judges, and she currently serves on the steering committee member of the National Task Force to End Sexual and Domestic Violence, as well as on the Washington State Women's Commission and the Washington State Gender and Justice Commission. She is a recipient of many awards for her work, including an American Bar Association Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence 2020 Vision Award. Welcome, Grace. We're so honored to have you with us. Sandra um, Shanahan is the program manager at the, of the Regional Domestic Violence Firearms Enforcement Unit in King County, Washington. The unit is one of the first in the nation to intervene to remove firearms in cases where the court has ordered their removal. Prior to starting this position at the, in 2017, she managed the protection order advocacy program at the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office since 2002. Sandra has worked for the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office in the Domestic Violence Unit since 1998. She has seen firsthand the issues survivors have to go through when seeking those protection orders. Sandra has served on various committees, including the Domestic Violence and Child Maltreatment Oversight Committee, the Domestic Violence Initiative, Child Death Review, and various other collaborative efforts to improve the system's response to domestic violence and firearms. Thank you, Sandra, for taking time to share your expertise uh, on the ground and experience with us. To get us started, um, I am uh, going to start uh, with a question, and uh, Sandra, I'm going to ask you this one first. What are some of the biggest barriers that you see in your work when it comes to su uh, helping survivors? Uh, thank you, Senator Dingra, and thank you so much for everybody joining the call today and for being here to discuss this really important issue. And I just want to put out right from the beginning that this content may be triggering for people. There may be folks on the call who've experienced these behaviors. Um, and we want to just give people the chance to take a break, walk away. This will be recorded and there will be a resource in the chat function um, that you can uh, refer yourself to. But as Senator Dingra mentioned, um, I've spent the last 20 years working in and around domestic violence protection orders. And with that experience, um, working directly with survivors as they sought out orders, you can't help but notice the things that work well and the things that don't work so well. And I think um, what has been so important is that the silver lining of the, of the pandemic is that it gave us an opportunity to try new things. 
And when we reflected on those different issues that were able to be addressed, like remote appearance and electronic service, um, and discussions about maybe keeping those in statute, it gave us the opportunity to look kind of whole cloth at all of the barriers over time that have impacted survivors. And the ones that really stand out in my mind from my experience are, we would have so many survivors who would seek out the courts for protection and they never even made it to the point where a judge could make a decision based on the merits. And that was because they couldn't keep missing work. They couldn't find childcare. They couldn't afford to miss more work. Uh, they couldn't get the other party served. So they're a process that was intended to be um, kind of a, a short-term process to relief would be protracted and take many, many months. And so we would have survivors who would initiate and just kind of have to wash out of the system before they got the protections that they were actually legally entitled to. Um, and as Senator Dinger said, we have so many, we have a robust menu of different kinds of civil protection orders that cover a lot of different harmful conduct, but they're confusing. And those statutes were created independently and weren't always aligned. And so there were inconsistencies in application. Um, we've also had experiences where survivors have language barrier or language access issues. And those things weren't always addressed consistently or a um, petitioner would seek out relief in one court and be experience a mini trial to obtain a protection order where in another court, the court is relying on the written record and some basic testimony. So, so those are some of the things that we experienced and um, the opportunity through 1320 to address so many of those barriers has really been a game changer for our state. And we're really, really grateful. There's more work to be done, um, but we're, we're absolutely on the right track, track to better support survivors. Thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And that is the testimony we heard over and over again, that um, something that was supposed to be a, a easy, accessible, quick fix for survivors to seek the help they needed was simply not working out that way in, in real life. Uh, Rithi Grace, I would uh, love to give you the opportunity to chime in on this question on some of the biggest barriers that you have seen in the work that you have done over the years. Go ahead, Rithi. I, I can add, um... You know, Sandra already highlighted sort of the inconsistencies uh, in the process and our program, we serve survivors in multiple counties and even the filing process was so inconsistent. It wasn't even getting to the hearing, um, but the filing process itself, when you file, when you get um, the temporary order back, um, how do you get informed about next steps? Um, where do you go? the process is so inconsistent. And that's especially problematic um, when you have survivors who might be fleeing their homes, um, moving to different counties, moving to different jurisdictions in order to get away from their abuser. And so depending on where they're then moving to, the process changes based on um, the new jurisdiction that they're at. And uh, I think the legislate 1320 has uh, really tried to make that process much more consistent because what we know with survivors is that they're dealing with so much trauma and instability what, wherever on the system side that we can actually make the process more consistent for them, at least that it allows for accessibility, greater accessibility and trust in the system. Um, so that has been a huge barrier that I think um, the legislation is addressing now. Thank you, Rizzi. Go ahead, Grace. Yeah, I was going to add to that, you know, um, one of the things that um, the legislation intended to address was trying to reduce the confusion between different kinds of orders, um, because when, you know, most people are seeking protection, um, they're not necessarily familiar with every intricacy of the law. And we heard, you know, over the years, I've heard uh, challenges for survivors that, you know, they might not have qualified technically for, you know, a certain kind of order because they didn't fit the, you know, they might not have had the right family relationship or they might not have had, you know, they weren't the right age or they weren't, you know, the kind of behavior might not have met the, the criteria for one type of order. And they, 
um, you know, so the, the legislation, I think, went a, a long way in addressing that. I and mean, I think there are other pieces that we've been hearing about. I sit on the Washington State Women's Commission, and we've been doing listening sessions all across the state uh, with advocates and survivors. And some of the other issues they've raised have, have you know, they've included those. And I think some of them have raised concerns about, um, you know, the privacy concerns about, you know, going to court and, and having all the documentation in the system and, you know, what the implications are when there's, um, they're named as parties in a, in, a, in a case and, you know, what concerns there might be um, for their employment or for um, their housing in the future, maybe insurance, et cetera. So I think there are still issues that we're looking at exploring, um, you know, it, that that future legislation may address, but those were some of the issues that we've heard about and, and definitely wanna echo the language access issues. Um, you know, I hear about that consistently at the local level and across the country where, um, you know, survivors that, that aren't, um, English speaking or even Spanish speaking in particular, you know, just really have such uh, so many barriers to getting information about how to proceed through the process. Yes, um, we heard over and over again about language um, access and, you know, what you talked about, um, the different kinds of uh, petitions. There are six different kinds. And for someone who is experiencing so much trauma to walk in and try to figure out which one is the right petition for them, uh, you know, do their best to fill it out and then be told by a judge, sorry, you filled out the wrong petition, you have to start the process all over again, is, um, is, is just so uh, demoralizing. And it really makes you think that no one is really out there looking for out for you. And so having a process where you really don't have a wrong door, where you can fill out the process and the judge can say, okay, you filled out the wrong petition, but you know what, this is the right petition for you. And all of your information is still valid. And we're just going to give you the right petition instead of um, what you filled out. And so really making sure that it is going to be centered on the survivor and their need for safety and to empower them to seek what, what they really want is, um, is such a tremendous improvement. And, and I agree with you on follow-up work to be done around privacy. This is huge. We keep hearing even over and over again about um, registering to vote. And when you register to vote, you have your address there. And as survivors of domestic violence, um, you can have confidential address, but really making sure that there is privacy around that throughout the system. So lots more work uh, to be done in that regard. The second um, question that we have that we wanted to talk about is something called cross petitions. And as we know, when we're talking about domestic violence, we're talking about power and control, we're talking about uh, individuals who are highly manipulative. So um, I was hoping really that maybe you can start off this discussion and um, tell us what are cross petitions um, and um, just how they uh, are dealt with in the courts right now. So cross petitions, um, Senator, as you pointed out, it's a tactic that often abusers will use um, against a survivor. So the way this happens, um, we've seen it for years, the way this has been happening in the courts is maybe the police were called and now who the abuser is, is being investigated and they're worried about where that investigation is going to go. So they, they're the first ones that get to court and file for a protection order against the survivor, trying to implicate the survivor as the abuser. Um, and, um, and then the survivor files their own petition later or um, as a way of punishing. Um, we've had cases, for example, where the abuser found out that the survivor is connected to an advocate or has filed for a protection order. And then the abusive person in that relationship then goes to court to file for their own protection order. And the idea is that um, through cross petitions, essentially co competing protection order cases, um, the survivor's exhausted because now you're trying to deal with two different cases. Sometimes what will happen is the abuser, instead of filing in the same court, they'll file in a different court, like a maybe survivor filed in superior court, abuser files in district court or files in a different county. Um, so it exhausts the survivor's resources and trying to address it in different courts. Um, the other thing it does is, and this is something I think is an abusive tactic, is it, it confuses, it confuses the court. Um, it, and um, 
that is, this is, cross petitions is a part of a larger sort of process that we called abusive litigation tactics, where the court system, the legal system is basically used to then continue to assert control over the survivor. It becomes a strategy that the abuser uses. And so um, cross petitions is one example of that. Often what we are trying to do in this situation is then draw attention to the court um, about the dynamics of the relationship, who has more power in that relationship, who has more control in that relationship, and how this, this cross petition is being used as a tool and that we don't want the courts to be um, perpetuating further abuse through, through the court system against a survivor. But that can be really confusing for a judge, especially when you're dealing with pro se litigants. Uh, and when I say pro se litigants, uh, these are people who do not have an attorney. And so they're going through the court process um, by themselves. And we also know in abusive relationships, often the abuser has access to more resources, access to finances. So what can end up happening is that the abusive party may have private counsel, may have an attorney who very eloquently in a sophisticated way is able to present to the court their side of the case. And then you have a survivor without an attorney um, who is then trying to explain to the court and essentially is on the defensive, um, trying to explain to the court why a protection order should not be issued against them, but they should be protected. And uh, we have amazing advocates in the community who are supporting survivors through this, getting them connected to legal resources like our program and other programs like Northwest Justice Project and like the volunteer lawyer programs around the state. But there are more protection order cases out there than there are attorneys. And um, the, these types of abusive litigation um, is something that we're always trying to work with the courts on and trying to educate trying to provide resources to advocates, provide resources to survivors so that they can navigate these systems better. And um, kind of talking about 1320 and the legislation, this, this is an area that I know there's been a lot of intentional thought around and making sure that the legislation is not a, a tool that are you is used by abusers that there are the proper sort of protections in place and guidelines in place to ensure that a survivor is still being centered their experience is still being centered through that process and um, one thing i'm excited about is um you know there's language around training training for judges this is a, a consistent feedback that we've received over years and I, I think grace you received this also in your listening sessions that we, we need the courts to have consistent training and understanding around these dynamics so that abusive litigation does not become a constant, but is something that we're able to respond to and we have the appropriate legal tools to respond to. Yeah, I was just- Thank you, Vivi. Oh, no, go ahead, Grace. I was yeah. only talking to you. <laughs> Uh, I just put in the chat, um, the legislature, you know, for those of you in the audience who aren't familiar, um, you know, the legislature did go ahead and pass some legislation specifically addressing abusive litigation and, um, you know, giving judges yet another tool to be able to address those cross petitions or, you know, be able to look at the um, pattern going on in um, filings in court to be able to, you know, specifically address that topic. And so I just wanted to highlight that as and, and thank thank the legislature for recognizing this particular uh, way that that abusers use the system to um, try to continue to harass and, and um, control the survivor. So and if if I may just quickly mm -hmm. add one thing that we talked about training, but one thing that's also exciting about uh, the legislation is that, for example, only one of the protection orders previously had this opportunity is called realigning parties, where if the court gets information from in a petition and it turns out that the petitioner may be the abuser and the respondent may be the victim, the court has the authority to realign the parties, meaning switch the parties around. 
Um, that was only available in one of the protection orders before that was not available in all the protection orders. And this, this statute now makes that more consistent in making sure that protection is available regardless of which, which process uh, an abuser may be trying to use through the protection order system. This is so great. I love having so much expertise uh, on a town hall and hearing from all of you. I just want to add that uh, the abuse of litigation is not something that is exclusive to um, domestic violence petitions. We actually see abuse of litigation all across the board that is done on a wide variety of issues. So this is not something that, I mean, while we absolutely want to be mindful of this in the domestic violence realm and make sure we're protecting against it, it, it is unfortunately that uh, something that the courts really need to step up and stop uh, when they recognize it and hold people accountable for using uh, the courts as a weapon um, instead of as a, as a tool. Uh, Sandra, I wanted to give you the opportunity to chime in on this topic. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think overall, I, I, I don't have a ton to add, except that we should be looking at abusive litigation, including cross petitions as a red flag for whether it's coercive control or other types of behavior that are used to intimidate um, and try to get people to back down or try to undermine their credibility. So we have tools to try to address these things and, and that is what's so critically important right now. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing up uh, coercive control. And I'm gonna ask um, Grace this, what is coercive control? And um, would you uh, tell us a little bit about what other states and the federal government are doing about this? Yes, sure, thank you. Um, so here, let me, I will put this up in a minute and after I talk, um, you know, I have a slide on here uh, about uh, the power and control wheel for that many have seen over the years. Um, so coercive control, you know, is a concept that we've been talking about, I wanna say for several, I mean, decades now that the domestic violence, um, Victim advocacy community has recognized as you know part of uh, domestic violence um, that um, you know, rec you know it, it is it refers to a you know a systematic pattern of behavior that you know establishes dominance over another person through intimidation, through isolation, through um, threats of violence, uh, through it's an ongoing um, you know pattern of course of controlling behavior that um, victims uh, often, you know, commonly say that that impact them just as much, if not more uh, than physical violence um, in domestic violence relationships. And so, I mean, I think some of the literature, the social science literature out there, you know, distinguishes um, course of control in domestic violence in the context of domestic violence as different from other types of domestic violence that might be just like situational um, violence where there's, you know, maybe unlawful physical harm caused to another person, but is not part of an ongoing pattern where, um, you know, there's, there's um, ongoing behavior intended to take away somebody's autonomy and or their, you know, ability to make, you know, decisions for themselves. Etc. And I just want to, you know, give an example. You know, I had heard from an advocate that has been doing this work for over 30 years, and she says that she's worked with over 40,000 people um, over the years. And her analysis of it is that it really goes to speaking to, um, you know, being able to take away somebody's, um, you know, control their day-to-day -day existence. And she talks about. Um, you know, a very highly public case that we've had in Washington State um, several years ago. And when I was at working at the Washington State Coalition Against Domestic Violence, we spent a lot of time examining it because it involved um, uh, the case of Crystal Judson and David Brain in Pierce County, where, you know, David Brain was the sheriff and he um, shot his wife in the parking lot. Um, a few days after she filed for divorce. Um, and, you know, it came out in a lot of the news articles and information that, you know, she had shared with her friends how um, coercive and controlling he was and to the point where, um, you know, she would wake up every morning and he uh, would um, expect that she would get on a scale to determine, you know, how much she weighed and whether or not her weight had changed, you know, from the day to day in terms of the level of monitoring and, 
and um, surveillance that she was living with um, on a day-to-day -day basis was you know, just a, a very clear example of um, what we're talking about when we say coercive control, that somebody feels like they have the ability to, they, that they should be managing you know, their intimate partner or their you know, family member at that level was, um, you know, was a very clear example. Um, with response to your question about, you know, what, what's been going on um, at the state and federal level about this, I mean, I, I want to flag for folks that course of control has been recognized in our domestic violence law for decades in certain parts of it, especially in civil proceedings. Um, the Violence Against Women Act has had recognized um, in the context of immigration laws. Um, they recognize that survivors of domestic violence can apply to petition for immigration status um, in the context if they can establish they are a victim or they've been subjected to battering or extreme cruelty. And that's been in the law since 1994 at the federal level. And you know, thousands of survivors across the country have been able to get protection as um, you know, VAWA, you know, in, in the context of immigration law as self-petitioners for, for um, you know, immigration protection. Um, in our own state law, there is um, language in our um, domestic violence victim shelter and services law that recognizes that services should be provided to victims of domestic violence and domestic violence is de determined to encompass a pattern of course of controlling behavior. Um, and so in terms of our own state law, we do you know, recognize course of control in that context. And there's a lot of work happening at the federal level. The current draft of the Violence Against Women Act has language um, encompassing course of control um, in the context of VAWA. And then uh, there's uh, work being done um, at the federal level uh, to update the model code on domestic violence, um, the National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges and the you know, ABA, American Bar Association Commission on Domestic Violence on which I sit, um, you know, that, that include, they're doing work on a model code that encompasses course of control as part of the definition in the context of civil, civil protections for, for folks. And then finally, lastly, um, our own state law that defines domestic violence that we've been talking about that provides protection in, um, uh, in uh, civil protection orders. I just wanna flag for folks that lots of other laws like protections for in housing as well as unemployment and in um, uh, employment leave, uh, leave from, you know, they all cross-reference the civil law definition. Um, and so to the extent that they're, um, you know, there needs to be recognition that course of control should afford people protections in the housing context, in the uh, employment context, in the unemployment context. It's, it's just something that folks should keep in mind as they're thinking about this. So I'll leave it there and I'm sure th there'll be more questions about this. So. Thank you um, so much for that. Um, and uh, were you gonna share your slide now on, um because I think it's always a good reminder for us to take a look at that power and control wheel. Um, it's always uh, interesting to me how much people learn when they see it and just that reminder on, on what it is and what it means and how much it really is based in reality that you have survivors who can identify where they are and, um, and what is going to happen next. I think this wheel is also so helpful in identifying all those aspects of course of control um, because it, um, it's, it is emotional, it's psychological, it's financial. Um, and, you know, Grace talked about <clears throat> the Crystal Judson example, but we see cases all the time where uh, survivors identity documents are being controlled by their abuser. It's not strangulation, it's not physical violence, it's not sexual assault, but it is controlling that survivor's life in a way that really prohibits them from being able to be independent of their, of their partner, of their abuser. We see um, threats against and controlling of a survivor's child or 
pet um, that keeps the survivor tethered to the abuser in a way. And it, again, it's not strangulation, it's not sexual assault, it's not physical violence. Um, and I know Grace is putting up the wheel. I'm, I promise you, I'm not trying to buy time, but like there are just so many examples like that. Um, one area that we're seeing more attention on that I'm actually excited the legislation also addresses is technology-based abuse. So when spyware is uploaded onto a survivor's phone, just to be able to track who they're talking to, where they're going. Um, all these are just examples of how course of control is another, another form of abuse, another form of violence that traditionally the law has not recognized in the past. Um, and so um, I just wanted to highlight a few more examples uh, based on what Grace shared. And, and I'll just add to that, you know, when Chaya, uh, when we first started um, Chaya, a lot of the issues and concerns we would get were um, around the abuser, um, like hiding the paperwork, like you said about holding on to ident uh, identity documents, not filing the correct paperwork for the person to get um, a green card, making sure that we, um, making sure that um, they don't get access to any of the financial records, banking, I mean, the list goes on and on. So this really is something we see all across the board, but especially in the immigrant community there, the opportunity for abuse is just so much um, higher. Uh, and Sandra, I would love for you to chime in on this as well. Yeah, and I really appreciate the time. And, and if there's one thing that has been a consistent gap um, related to the protection order process is how um, the experiences that the lived experiences that people actually have are just not acknowledged in law. Our law is very violent incident specific. It often needs to be recent. It often needs to be injurious. And for people who are experiencing coercive control, there may be violence, there may not be. Um, but if you were hit two years ago, your abuser doesn't really need to keep doing that to continue to keep you under threat. And so I just wanted to share a couple of, of real life examples. So we have, um, we've had a case in the past where a, a, a victim had to literally sign in and out every time she left the home. So she'd have to say what time she left, what time she came home, and what she did. And this included the minutia of taking trash out or talking to a neighbor. We've had people experience threats to their workplace in the sense of um, the abuser would call the boss and say she's removed really sensitive files from work um, to try to create um, havoc at her workplace, which threatens her employment, or calling the workplace multiple times and harassing coworkers to get to, to get her on the phone. And so it's all of these um, behaviors that form the backdrop that keep people kind of trapped in these relationships because they're punished when they step out of line. Um, and these are just things that we just, that aren't acknowledged right now. Um, in our protection order law, which makes it really complicated for people to get the relief that they need. Thank you um, for all of those examples. Grace, uh, we have the wheel up now, so I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, so for just for background, this is from the Domestic Violence Intervention Program from um, Duluth, Minnesota, and they developed this in the late um, 80s or mid 80s, you know, after interviewing hundreds and hundreds of survivors of domestic violence. And um, the, they identified, you know, eight main sets of tactics. And this, you know, the power control wheel, there are various versions for in different contexts. There's one that relates to immigrant survivors, one that relates to um, economic, you know, economic uh, abuse in particular. And, you know, there are different ones uh, focused on different uh, communities, but you know the the whole um, point of it is that you know the physical and sexual violence you know are or threats of those things you know are are there lingering to to help um, you know all uh, focus um, 
the the control tactics and and um, abuse tactics uh, all for to the with the main point being power and control over the um, a survivor. Um, so you know that that's just it's a uh, in you'll be receiving a link to some materials at the end for folks that are more in, are interested in in you know getting a copy of this or or learning more information. But I also just wanted to. Um, share that, you know, as the Washington State Women's Commission, I'm a member of that commission. Um, and we, as I said earlier, have been holding listening sessions across the state with advocates, um, you know, that work with survivors as well as attorneys and then uh, numerous survivors who've been directly impacted. And um, I would say almost univer universally, universally, uh, folks feel, you know, they all have experienced um, course of control in their relationships, or you know, they are the concern that that survivors have articulated really need to be addressed, um, and that they feel like you know currently are is not being addressed well in the context of um, the court system. And so, um, and universally, we heard that in the work with survivors across the state. That, that often course of control tactics are the things that, that you know, in addition to like serious physical violence, what really sticks in, in um, survivors' um, experiences and, and that they feel, you know, that most hurt by is, are the course of controlling tactics. And, and so um, as part of the um, follow-up to House Bill 1320, you know, we uh, sought to, input from the community to be able to share with all of you and uh, the work group will be providing a report um, to the legislature to, have, to share you know the input that folks have have, have you know, given with their time yeah and thank you for that grace you know to me um, I feel like the legislation that does the best work and gets it right is um, our bills that come from the people who have been doing the work and um, and thank you for those listening sessions, because it really is, you know, what is going on on the ground that we can make sure that as a legislative body we're addressing, not trying to fix problems that people think are happening in the system, but actually trying to fix the problems we are seeing um, at, at the ground level impacting people's lives. And I do want to do a shout out to a Judge Ann Levinson, who really did so much work um, on making sure that this bill was able to clearly articulate all the issues uh, and the problems that people are seeing and really come up with a solution that we, we know will help individuals' lives, make it easier for them to get that petition, uh, make sure that they are safer. And um, it, it always comes down to making sure we are listening to people who have the challenges and coming up with a solution that matches those challenges. So uh, we already have a whole bunch of questions and some hands that have gone up. So um, the first question that has come in, and I was wondering whether this would or not. Uh, the first question is, I recently saw The Maid on Netflix and was greatly troubled that Washington does not have a law to help survivors who are experiencing controlling behavior. Does this new bill fix this? Um, so I'll just say that the bill as it passed the House actually did have language on course of control. That unfortunately was taken out in the Senate. Um, we do have work groups as Grace mentioned and work that's being done in really order to make sure that we are uh, addressing it. I myself have not seen the maid, but I cannot tell you how many times people have asked me whether I have and really recommended that I do. So I do wanna open up uh, this question to our panelists and hear um, what they have to say about the maid or uh, course of control and um, and what we're going to do in the state of Washington to fix this. So who wants to take that first? Ruthie, why don't we go to you just because we haven't heard from you in a bit. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I am a part of the Gender and Justice Commission and uh, the work groups that the Senator is uh, referring to are actually currently housed under the Gender and Justice Commission. And this has been a cross section of practitioners, judges, advocates, um, survivors, uh, providers who are uh, involved in the system and involved in, on the community side as well. 
um, providing input on uh, and recommendations on uh, it, what a course of control um, definition should consider um, since uh, this, uh, since Senator Dinger is talking about the, the um, legislation, there is going to be a trailer bill that is looking at course of control. And uh, we've been asked to provide recommendations around best practices uh, around how to define and how to think about course of control um, as a part of the protection order um, statutes definition of domestic violence. And the, the attempt is to address those concerns like the cross petition concern. What do you do when an abuser is also using the legal system against a survivor? And so through the work that uh, we're doing in our work groups, um, these are all the considerations that we're uh, addressing and trying to address um, with our recommendations to the legislator about course of control. I have not seen them made either. Just just with the work I do, I, I kind of need a break from this in my personal life, um, but I've heard quite a bit about um, uh, essentially course of control that is highlighted um, in that. And um, I think Washington is there now to be able to address it. Thank you for that. We're getting so many questions in through chat and I see the hands up as well. So I'm actually just gonna take another question from chat, which is kind of related. Uh, this is from Cameron. He says, how do the current protect, uh, because it's so related to what we're talking about, protective uh, order laws acknowledge elements of non-physical coercive control and how will the new one do a better job acknowledging those elements of abuse? I think we've discussed a lot of it um, already, but Sandra, if I may ask you, uh, in the past, uh, were there any ways in which um, you could help survivors when they were dealing with um, non-physical coercive control? And, you know, I, I... I think still to this day, even though I don't work directly with survivors so much in my new role, um, I'm haunted, honestly, by the experiences that people would walk in the door with um, that we all knew were domestic violence that we were not able to get people help for. So when somebody comes in with non-injurious or non-physical violence or non-sexual assault, but is terrorized every day and in fear from their partner, um, we would really just try to help them craft their petition or write their petition so that they could show the court how they did fear um, for imminent bodily harm. And sometimes it worked because the behavior is egregious enough, even though it hasn't been physically violent yet, um, in some situations, people didn't get the order. And I think what's really challenging is when our laws don't um, include the behaviors that people experience, then that gap can be misused against, against survivors. And I think that's what, what I would see regularly uh, um, in court is um, lots of course of control behavior the court um, would hear from the respondent's attorney that this isn't domestic violence and she's just trying to keep him away from the children or trying to misuse this process to get a leg up in a custody battle. Um, and because none of those behaviors are enumerated, her behavior wasn't acknowledged or was, was misused. And so it's really, really critically important that we integrate those behaviors into the statute because those are honestly the things that are um, causing the greatest harm. We have cases where um, a woman, her partner always wore a, a gun, a loaded gun in a holster all around the house all day long. And anytime there was any kind of arguing, he would plant his hand over top of that holster. Well, under our law, did he threaten her? Is there, you know, I'm, no. But she got the message and she knew what that meant. And that's where that disconnect is. So I, I appreciate that question from the audience because it's so critically important. And thank you for that, Sandra. That's uh, really the example that come to my mind as well because I have worked with survivors and it's the same thing. He would point to where the gun, loaded gun was kept and that was enough because she knew what he meant when he when he made that gesture. 
Uh, I'm gonna take some hands that are raised and we'll go back to the uh, questions. Thank you so much uh, for everyone for engaging so much on this issue. Dylan O'Connor, um, please uh, go ahead and ask your question. And I think I'll just take us a second to unmute you. There you go. Got it, thank you. Yeah, um, that's that's uh, a great pivot to, to my question. I was hoping that Sandra might be able to speak uh, with a little more detail on the role that firearms play in coercive control, and then maybe um, an answer from the panel on how those dynamics might help inform definitional change. So we see firearms um, throughout our experience in working with survivors. And in some of those cases, they're used overtly, like you get the firearm is pointed at someone or held to their head. Um, and in a, a lot of situations, it's, it's not direct. It's cleaning the firearm during an argument or after an argument. It's driving around with a loaded firearm at really high speeds and threatening to shoot the person who cut you off. Um, it, it plays a role in so many different aspects of our work. And one of the really important things that 1320 has done is to try to um, bake consistency in about the importance of compliance with orders to surrender weapon, because we know how dangerous and how high risk these situations are when there are firearms, firearms that are accessible. And then I'll allow my panelists to uh, address the other issues, thanks. I think firearms is a crucial part of the um, thinking about the spectrum of abuse and threats that survivors go through. And um, even when firearms aren't involved, other weapons can be involved. Like I, I think about a survivor I worked with where, where their abuser just left a belt hanging on the bed bedpost all the time. And it was just a reminder. Um, he actually never used the belt on her but it was always there hanging as a reminder that he was not afraid to use it if necessary. Um, and so I, I think one thing with considering a definition is uh, really thinking about what, what are the consequences that the survivor is recognizing? Um, I think a lot of people think, oh, there can be sort of unhealthy relationships or toxic relationships. And that's true. Some of us have maybe been in sort of toxic relationships ourselves, but the question then becomes, what is the consequence of leaving that relationship? If there are consequences uh, that make it, make it so that you can only, you have to hide the fact that you're trying to leave, that you are afraid of the consequences of leaving, um, those are the sort of, I think, um, considerations that are important in really defining a uh, course of controlling actions. And I, yeah, on, on that note, I was, you know, we were reading some of the, I was reading some of the research um, and thinking about this and, and there are, you know, um, researchers that theorize that for coercive control to be effective, um, there needs to be both, you know, uh, you know, kind of an expectation or demand for um, subservience and then a threat to actually enforce compliance. Um, and so to the extent that the threats are intended to, you know, create constant fear, it allows the abuser to be able to main con uh, maintain control. And so that's just one of the things that as we're thinking about how to define it, really thinking through exactly that, the consequence of not, not complying, right, to, to the course of controlling tactics. Um, so, you know, as, as we move forward, you know, there's, there's uh, work that we still, I think, need to do in, in figuring that out, but. Absolutely, and, and all of those uh, examples were just right on point. We did have a question in chat from Jennifer Como, and I know she did raise her hand as well, but I don't see her coming off camera. Uh, oh, there you are, Jennifer. Yes, please uh, go ahead and read your question, even though I have it in, uh, in chat, I'll give you the opportunity to um, speak to our panelists. Hello. Um, could you read my question? I'm sorry, there's a lot of static coming from your end. Yeah. Okay. okay. Why don't I why, why don't, don't I read I, the question? Why don't I read the question? And then if you have something to and add, you can do that. So uh, Jennifer writes, um, 
This is House Bill 1449 from February 2021 that you'd like to bring attention to it for Washington. Um, um, and this is a bill that creates the crime of coercive control. I believe it's been sponsored by uh, Representative Moss Brucker. And um, Jennifer, I don't know if I want, should I read the rest of what you wrote as well in chat? Um, no. Um, you know, she, I think she talks about her personal life and um, the abuse of uh, legal issues she's going through um, and just how um, she's been feeling about it. And so um, um, I'm sorry that you're, that you can't uh, talk um, to the panelists yourself, but, you know, we hear this over and over again uh, about course of control and the, the impact that it has on survivors. And uh, I, if this is a House bill, I'm not that familiar with it since it hasn't come over to the Senate, but I look forward to taking a look at it. But what is clear from the example you've shared and, and the interest you've shown uh, and from people we've been hearing from all over the state, that um, this is something that we as a state have to be able to respond to. And uh, Christina, say for you, you put a question as chat, but I see you off um, video. So I would love to give you the opportunity to ask your question. Uh, in person. So if you would like to go ahead and do that, you can do that now. Yeah, um, I had a question and a comment. Um, I'm a directly impacted um, survivor that's also been criminalized through the system. So a couple of questions are directly impacted black women involved in providing feedback and more specifically women that are also criminalized survivors. Um, I'm worried about how perpetrators can abuse this law and further criminalize survivors. And thank you for that. That is something uh, I know that we are all extremely concerned about. I just want to make it clear that what we're talking about is absolutely in the civil um, component is only. It, it is really about the civil protection orders. Um, it is not about uh, criminalization. Um, and I'll open it up to the rest uh, of the panelists, but I do want to say that you know one of the other bills last session that I'm really, really proud of is a bill I had that um, that actually makes it easier for um, survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault and trafficking to get their criminal history vacated. Uh, we all know that trauma does not exert itself only as a memory, it exerts itself as a reaction. And the criminal justice system has done a terrible job in, um, in working with survivors. And so we've seen a lot of criminalization of survivors. And so the more conversations uh, we can have, the education we can have, about how we're dealing with, um, with um, survivors who are dealing with trauma and be a more trauma-informed um, uh, community when it comes to criminal justice, the better off we all are. But we had a bill last session to do exactly that, is to help vacate criminal history for survivors um, uh, to understand that. And uh, I will plug the program that King County has. I know that it was highlighted in a domestic violence symposium last week where um, it is about making sure that they're providing treatment and services and support rather than uh, our diversion program for um, survivors uh, instead of having them go through the criminal justice system because recognizing exactly that, that you cannot really be criminalizing survivors. So I will get off my soapbox um, because Christina, you, you brought up something that I'm very passionate about and um, Iridi, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, the program that you're talking about is Survivor First uh, through the King County YWCA and um, Doris O'Neill, who's the head of that program, is a great resource. Um, and uh, that program is specifically looking at um, Black survivors who are facing criminal potential criminal consequences, working with prosecutors to ensure that they're not charged and that they do get access to this service. Um, our program works with incarcerated survivors. Um, the Northwest Justice Project, their RISE program works with incarcerated survivors. And so a lot of the uh, information um, that we have tried to provide in this uh, legislation does try to address um, the experience of incarcerated survivors. And so for example, this is one reason why uh, course of control was really important to us because what it allows the court to do is recognize that full spectrum of abuse instead of only focusing sometimes uh, on the one incident, which sometimes maybe the survivor did engage in violence in a defensive uh, to defend 
um, and a responsive tactic, and then the survivor gets incarcerated or is charged uh, or ends up with a protection order, and then the court does not necessarily get the full spec, full picture of what what that relationship was like that led up to that point where the survivor responded. Um, and so this is why the course of control is really something that I think many of us in the field are uh, wanting to ensure is uh, implemented properly. Um, another aspect of this legislation that I think a lot of us are excited about who work with incarcerated survivors is that um, in the past, you had to be able to come to court to be able to file for a protection order. And now um, there's language in there that if you are um, uh, unable to file for yourself because of capacity or custody or something, I, I forget the exact language, another person can file a protection order for you. The reason why we wanted this language in there is that we've seen abusers who've used the legal system, the survivor is now dealing with criminal consequences and once they are out, they are still back to having to face this, their abuser. And they, survivors should be able to access uh, the protection order process regardless of where they're at. Um, and so making sure that if they are um, incarcerated, but now maybe leaving, um, that they still, they can hopefully leave with a protection order in place because the court was able to actually consider not just the, maybe act that led them led to the incarceration, but also everything leading up to the incarceration and really highlight. Um, and I, I will also say, especially for incarcerated survivors, um, the family law system can often become another source of trauma and not being believed. And this is where we also think that uh, we've seen how course of control, being able to share those examples, have that enumerated in the law can really make a difference in the family law system as well to ensure that somebody who's experiencing incarceration can still maintain custody of their children. And, and if I may just add one small point um, that, that we want training on course of control, not just for judges, but for all system actors, law enforcement, child welfare, advocates, court staff, because it's a, it's a new lens with which to perceive what is occurring and better understand it. And my hope is that with that understanding and awareness, um, we will see less of what you've experienced. Thank you for that. Um, I think that connection with family court um, and family law is, is really critical. Uh, and this leads us actually to another question from Lacey. Um, and the question she uh, Lacey had was what efforts are being made to educate judges on abusive litigation? And I don't know if, um, and if you can um, answer that, because we uh, aren't really talking um, about um, training for judges on abusive uh, litigation, though I do know that there are some judges on um, um, who are present here. So if any of the judges want to bring themselves on camera and talk about it, I'm happy to do that. But the panelists, are you guys aware of uh, trainings that are happening for a judicial branch on uh, abusive litigation? Maybe while judges unmute themselves, um, I will say that uh, abusive litigation is something that has been in the DV bench book, the judicial DV bench book for a few years now. I think Legal Voice first sort of drafted that um, appendix and there have been ongoing trainings. The DV symposium, which just ended last week, I think every year, every other year, there is a session on abusive litigation. And I'm always excited to see judicial officers who've attended that. And um, I, I'm hoping some of the judicial officers who are here can speak more to sort of the internal trainings that happen. And I'll just say, I think Grace put in chat that uh, these trainings have been happening since 2016. Oh, you're on mute, Grace. Oh, and then we have a judge too. Um, please do. <laughs> Oh, we will unmute you to make sure uh, you have the ability to chime in. Yeah, it's been ahead, part wait. of the, it was, it's been part of the judge's manual um, on domestic violence since 2016. And um, so I can, I can track down the link for that and put it in the chat. But, but yeah, that's always been part of that. I know that the King County Symposium 
that you know we've we've done training at the King County Domestic Violence Symposium in the judges track specifically. There have been workshops on that topic. Not every year, um, you know, there is a universal challenge of getting ongoing training for judges on a whole variety of topics. But um, you know, to the extent that there are opportunities to to do the training, there are there have been many, and um, we keep trying to do more. So. <laughs> And, and judge, we would love to have your input uh, on any of these issues um, and what you see in your courtroom. Sure, I'll, I'll stick to the first question, which was the um, training. So um, relative to Judicial College, I'll be one of the instructors and we will be including this, I believe, as part of a topic, um, as a topic for uh, the new judicial officers at Judicial College 2022. And just as an aside, there's, there's any number of trainings that judges need or judicial officers need. And so the folks who deal with education for the judicial officers are, are mindful of that and do lots of invitations out for topics and um, folks respond. And then there's discussion about what is chosen. So we have the conferences in the spring and in the fall. And so, um, those are, there's many important topics for us to cover. And so I am mindful that um, this is one that um, in light of the new legislation uh, can be included in training and I can work with some education folks to make that request. So just so you know, we're, we're mindful of it um, and it's something that um, um, with everything else we're training on and all lots of new legislation um, we're, we're trying to stay abreast of it all. So I will certainly work with them to um, bring that to their attention as well. Thank you I, so much, Judge. Go ahead, Ruby. I would just want to add that Judge Shea Brown uh, is overseeing the 1320 work group. So she's actually very much entrenched in, um, in a lot of these conversations that are happening. And I'll just say thank you for all the work that you're doing and all the committees are doing on this. It's, it's just so critical. And we as a state have not really had this opportunity to take a look at all of these laws together. Uh, they've just kind of, you know, been uh, enacted one after the other, but really not have that, uh, that, um, that system-wide look on how do they interact with each other? How are they really working? What are the barriers? How can we make sure that we are centering the voice of the survivor and the needs of the survivor and making sure we have a system that is responsive um, to their needs? We do have a question um, in, in chat about um, the vulnerable adult protection and some of the changes done to some of the other protection orders. And I'll just say, I know a little bit was mentioned about being able to file on someone's behalf. I will say the experts I have uh, right here are experts in sexual assault and domestic violence. So if any of them want to chime in, they, they can, but um, I'll, I'll just say while we did make um, that system efficient as well. Um, the focus of this really has been about domestic violence, but I'll let Sandra uh, chime in on that. Yeah, I just have a small piece, um, but a really critically important piece. Um, in 2014, laws were changed to enable people who were obtaining civil domestic violence protection orders to seek an order to surrender and prohibit weapons. That applied across every order except vulnerable adult. Um, so with 1320, vulnerable adults will now have that opportunity to seek out protection from firearms. So that's what I know about um, many of the changes with, with BAPOs, but it's a critically important one and it was a huge gap and I don't know why that existed, but it's now been addressed. Thank you for that. Um, and we have now, I know there was someone else who had raised their hand and then put it down, Megan Allen. I don't know if you wanted um, to re-raise your hand, but while you make that decision, we do have a question from Ivan Sandoval. Ivan, go ahead. And um, I think you've been unmuted at this point in time and asked your question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you, everyone. This is very helpful. So I'm Ivan Sandoval. I work for the King County Clerk's Office. And I think one of the huge benefits from the new protection order bill is that it was initially intended to make it easier for survivors, right? For the customers seeking a protection order. 
However, I'm also part of some of the committees with many people here, uh, but I'll also um, in this meeting. And what I've seen is that we may also be creating some barriers or challenges for some of those customers and petitioners. For instance, the way I look at it is um, currently we have a seven, six page petition that the customer fills out uh, in order to seek a protection order. Our experience in helping these customers is that a lot of them don't even know or need extra help in filling out this documentation. Um, now with the new protection order bill, because we're combining five protection orders into one combined documentation, it's now a petition that it's currently 18 to 20 pages long. So I get it, you know, we're trying to, I guess, you know, get rid of barriers to the customers. But at the same time, we're also, in my opinion, we're also creating some additional barriers, especially for people that, you know, English is not their first language, uh, or that they don't, you know, a lot of our people don't know any legal terminology. And when we're creating these forms, we're making it in a way that are also making barriers for a lot of these petitioners. So I wonder what solutions do you have in, I guess, counterbalancing the, you know, solving some of the issues, but also creating some of these potential issues for the people that are seeking a protection order. In addition, you know, I, I believe the, the bill was created with not either zero or not um, a lot of input from the clerk's offices in the state, which in my opinion would have been super helpful and valuable. Um, so my question is, what solutions do you have for counterbalancing those coming issues? And then two, are there any legislative changes that are that will be happening to make um, even you know this this bill even more effective for for the people that we serve? Thank you so much, um, Ivan. I actually really like how thoughtful uh, your question was. That counterbalancing is exactly what we were doing, and I think that one of the consequences is that longer length of petition. And um, that is something um, I'm really hopeful that with technology we can, and, and the way people apply for it, that we have a streamlined process techno uh, technology-wise in, in streamlining it. But one of the things that I, I cannot tell you how many times we heard is that someone would fill out a petition and um, go through the process, go to the court, and the judge would look at it and say, sorry, you have the wrong petition. And then they would have to restart the process. That was something that was identified over and over again. And so that was one of the main reasons for consolidating them and having one so that there is no wrong door in really making sure that, um, that regardless of what box is checked, they're able to get the help they need. And this was, again, um, more true for those individuals where you had language issues or unfamiliarity with the court process because they didn't know what they were doing because there were so many options. So, um, so that balancing has resulted in a longer petition. Um, and so, you know, this is where like making sure we keep watching and seeing how it's implemented, what we can continue to improve the system with. But this is one of the improvements that were recommended and that were made. And I'll let the other panelists talk about this as well. The language access is huge. I mean, the, the courts and the clerks have been, um, have had the requirement to provide documentation in different languages for a very, very long time. But it is a very expensive process. And unfortunately, courts, many courts do it well, other courts don't. And so this is really about making sure we are reinforcing um, a requirement that's already existed about language access and uh, making sure that it's being consistently applied. So I'll, I'll mention that on the language access. And again, there is so much more work we have to do as a state in order to make sure that um, not even in this realm, but just across all government services, we're doing a better job of uh, providing um, information in languages and in words that are more accessible because you can't just translate the words, right? The legalese don't translate well. You have to be able to translate in a manner that makes it easy for people to understand. Um, and to your other point about clerks involvement, we, we heard from lots and lots and lots and lots of clerks. I think one of the issues is that different courts do it differently. 
and clerks in different courts do things differently. And so it was really fascinating. Um, literally, I would have meetings where I would have certain clerks tell me certain things, and then another meeting where the clerks would tell me something different because they're doing things so differently. And so it was very challenging to try to figure out, um, you know, what was consistent. So it was based on best practices. You know, what are some of the best practices that we do want to formalize? Because it, it really is. Um, every courtroom, every jurisdiction has a different process for the same petitions. And not even in different jurisdictions. Courts in the same jurisdictions many times have a different process. So a lot of this, when we talk about harmonizing um, the procedures on this bill, this is a part of it, was, um, was really getting that understanding of why those differences exist and how we can pick what is the best way to move forward. And uh, with that, I will open it up to the rest of the panelists uh, to address some of these issues. And so we will have a trailer bill next session. Um, that bill is really to kind of tweak and uh, again, uh, make those efficiencies to make sure it can um, work. But, you know, making consistency goes a long way. From, um, from survivors' perspective, especially as we talked about them moving to uh, different areas for safety and just understanding that the courts are actually working in the same way because right now they aren't. I see a lot of heads nodding, but I would love for you guys to chime in. I'll just add that whenever a form is changed or um, updated or a new form is created when uh, there's a new statute, there's always concern, and of course, in the I think the first year or two, there is there are going to be more issues as the system is adjusting to it, um, as advocates are learning the new form. I think about like a lot of the sexual assault advocates we work with; they know the SAPO forms really well. It is going to mean that as advocates and as attorneys and providers, we are going to have to refamiliarize ourselves with the new form. But even with the longer forms, in the end, um, we've seen this also, uh, like I think about family <laughs> law, like survivors of all background, not survivors, litigants of all backgrounds are filing for dissolution, for divorce, and it requires a lot of different forms. And it can be confusing, but there are a lot of resources that have been created to make that information more accessible. I think how Washington Law Help is like such a great resource for the community and making forms more accessible and understandable. And um, I, I under, with this legislation, I think there's language throughout it about developing resources, developing information that helps make the forms more accessible. And Ivan, you and I are on the Protection Order Forms Committee that, and this is the conversation that we're having and how do we simplify it? So, I mean, it's definitely happening now and we're thinking about it very proactively. And we recognize that the forms are getting long, lo longer than the original petition. But if that means that fewer survivors are gonna have their paperwork um, dismissed initially, just because they filled out um, the wrong form, then it, it seems like that's, that's the balance. And um, I will also just say as a legal aid attorney coming more from the community side, there's a huge power imbalance between how much power the court and the clerk's office has and the system has versus a uh, individual survivor has, which is why I think um, it was uh, really important to center survivor experiences and voices in this process, because in the end, the system is there to serve and we want to be able to serve sur more survivors holistically and ensure that they are getting access. And it does mean that we are gonna go through blips as we adjust through the new process, but um, this is not the first time statutes have been introduced and this is not the first time new forms have been created. And um, this is where I think like the collaboration that's happening now and getting feedback from the clerk's office and the courts is so important for um, next steps as we move forward. Yeah. And I was just going to add to this as as the, you know, in speaking to Senator uh, Dinger in particular, um, you know, the need for making sure that folks have access to advocacy 
to legal advocacy, to um, legal services and to support for, you know, programs like courthouse facilitators to the extent that, you know, those programs exist. I, you know, those are, are things that, you know, funding for legal advocates, funding for legal representation, funding for those courthouse facilitators and staff that can help people man, uh, maneuver as well as um, funding for translation interpretation as it relates to court, you know, court houses themselves. I can't, um, can't impress upon you, you know, folks enough that th those need to be lifted up when we're talking about, um, you know, how it is that we make sure our systems function um, so that they're accessible for folks. And so, I mean, that, you know, that's, of course, everybody's going to say that. And, you know, it really is true to be able to, um, you know, from my years at the Domestic Violence Coalition, we knew, you know, that people having access to a domestic violence advocate, not just to fill out the forms, but also to do the safety planning that went along with, like, what's it mean to fill out a form in this way? And what do you do when the form, you know, the, the you get an order and it's violated? I mean, all the pieces of that are so important. And so um, I'll just leave it at, I hope that folks listening, you know, can can help support um, making sure that these systems are funded so that that um, uh, they do function. I just wanted to add, I, I just really want to echo that point. Um, a lot of people are funneled to the protection order system from law enforcement and um, a protection order is a great tool, but it doesn't work well for everyone. And so having a facilitator or an advocate who can be there as a frontline person to explain what it is, this is in fact a lawsuit you're starting. Um, some people will say that's exactly what I need and others may pursue other options outside of the court system. So I cannot echo that strongly enough that, that having those resources available is critically important. And thank you, Ivan, for bringing that up. Um, and thank you, Sandra, for saying that, because that's exactly it. This is just another resource or another tool in the toolbox uh, to be used. I think no one is saying that this is the only solution or this is something that all survivors need to do, but this is really about making sure that when you take a look at the gamut of, um, of resources that are out there, that this is a tool that should be used when the survivor chooses um, for themselves to utilize it. And then making sure that once that choice is made, that the system actually works for the survivor. Um, we are actually at the end of the hour. I do wanna uh, thank everyone who tuned in to have this discussion. Um, I know this was not an easy discussion. We talked about a lot of different things um, and it was a very serious discussion, very technical at, at times. But um, I think this is what happens when you really want to make um, real change. I will go around and make sure everyone gets a chance to say their final words. But I, I wanted to say that you know these bills don't happen in a vacuum. They don't happen because some elected official decides to write some words and put the names to it. These bills pass because of, of the community. These bills pass because people advocate for them, um, agencies come up, organizations and, um, and individuals, local Washingtonians who come in and testify and talk about their experience and their stories and really make that plea for a solution, um, a solution that works for everybody. So I do wanna thank everybody who engaged on this topic, everyone who came and testified, everyone who wrote emails um, and any uh, anything that you did to help with this bill. And I especially wanna thank the survivors for sharing their stories over and over and over again. I, I know it is not easy to relive that trauma, um, but unfortunately it's those personal experiences and those stories that make these bills pass. It, it really is what, enables legislators to vote uh, yes on so many of these bills. So uh, I do wanna thank um, everyone, but especially the survivors for, um, for, reliving, for reliving their trauma every time they testify. And unfortunately, we are going to need many of those advocates again next session when we uh, help perfect this bill. So thank you once again to our panelists. Thank you to everyone who tuned in. Uh, if anyone would like to follow up, or um, 
testify or write letters of support for any future legislation, please do uh, email my office and we will be happy to coordinate that. And with that, I will turn it around and let's go in the order of Grace, Rithi and Sandra. Thank you. Yeah, I just um, wanted to thank you for hosting this panel and giving us this, the opportunity to lift up, you know, what we've been hearing from um, from survivors and from advocates from across the state. And 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 Senator Dingra, you will be, you know, getting the report from um, the Washington State Women's Commission, and we'll continue. Um, to not only address the questions that the legislature asked of us during the process, we've you know heard of many other issues that have come up that were outside the scope of uh, House Bill 1320 relating to survivors' experiences of the system and you know ways that they uh, would like the legislature to um, address the the. Um, challenges that they are facing, especially as it relates to. Um, protection orders and family court, et cetera. So um, I look forward to, to hearing from, you know, as we continue our listening sessions uh, through the Women's Commission and other contexts, um, look forward to hearing from folks and uh, look forward to engaging with all of you more. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Dingra. Thank you everyone for joining us. I um, have been in my position for uh, almost uh, 10 years now and at through the years, the legislative process when it comes to survivors, it's always been a patchwork of trying to fix little things. And I'm so excited at how like robust this uh, legislation has been um, because of really trying to think about a whole process. And um, I'm excited for all the voices that have been a part of that process. And as the senator in indicated, there's still opportunity to still get involved and provide and support and even critique. And uh, so I'm excited uh, to see this next um, chapter. And uh, also from the 1320 work group, we're looking forward to sending you our assessments, our recommendations. Thank you. Yes, and I, I wanna thank Senator Dingra and everyone on the call and all the very thoughtful questions. And this is a monumental change. I think it's gonna really have such a positive impact for survivors. And it's also important to point out that when we improve access through remote, remote access and electronic service, we're also helping people who are responding to these orders as well. Those access issues are helpful across the board. Um, so we wanna fine tune with the trailer bill we really, really, once everything is in place, we really need to focus on implementation and training. And I've learned from my work in firearms that implementation is where the rubber hits the road. And that's where we make the biggest difference in how these new laws are carried out. And then hopefully there'll be some evaluative piece uh, at the end of all of this so that we can learn from our experience. So thank you everyone. What a pleasure to be here. Thank you all so much. So much more on this later. Take care. Bye-bye.